Not everybody's going to be in the enviable position of being able to buy a boat from brand new, but unless you approach it carefully, buying second hand may not bring the degree of savings you might imagine. For a number of reasons, it can be harder and more stressful buying second hand than buying new, as very often you'll be looking at a complete package with all the take it or leave it problems that can bring. Even if you know the seller, you can never be totally certain of an outfit's history. Has the engine been regularly serviced and flushed? What maintenance has been carried out on the trailer brakes and bearings? And has there been any patched up damage to the hull? It's difficult to know what might or might not have happened to an outfit, but it should be possible to rule some potentially major problems either in or out. The best single piece of advice I would offer is never take any seller's word for anything. And never be in too much of a hurry to buy either, or you could finish up with a boatload of regrets. There are a lot of well looked after second hand outfits out there being offered for sale for genuine reasons. Dealers and manufacturers regularly take them in part exchange from anglers progressing up through the market and may well offer some sort of a guarantee. But there are also some poorly maintained substandard outfits out there too, some of which might look fine on the outside but are not fine in the areas you can't see. Let's start by taking a look at the focal point of the outfit, the boat. Unlike buying a trailer or an engine second hand, with a boat you get pretty much what you see so examine it closely. The one area you will not be able to see clearly is the cavity beneath the floor. Even so, there are still pointers to look out for that might suggest all either is or isn't well. The logical place to start the inspection is the outer hull. Look for gel damage along the keel and transom edges. Gel chips are fairly easy to make good provided they are sorted out early. Also, Check for cracks where the hull sits on the trailer rollers and steer well clear of any structural repairs. This is going to be less of a problem where the weight of the hull is spread evenly across many large diameter rollers acting as pressure points. Trailers with skids made from wood fixed to a metal underframe and finished off with a wrap of carpet for cushioning also distribute the downward pressure well, but in a different way. This is the type of roller setup that has in the past been responsible for hull cracks particularly when heavy boats without modern underfloor strengthening have been put onto them, channeling a huge amount of weight through such a small point. Trailers like the one described previously also tend to have small diameter rubber rollers spread out along the main spine, taking some of the weight of the boat through its keel. The main problem with these is that they quickly lose their ability to turn when the weight of the boat is being dragged along them, resulting in flattening or total wear through exposing the metal shaft which then scrapes along the gel coat of the keel. And if that doesn't damage the keel, then being lifted off the rollers by a swell and dumped down hard on the sharp edges of the support bracket certainly will. Which is why swapping upright and spine rollers for banks of side rollers makes so much more sense. Hopefully. There should be enough second hand trailers like this one and sufficient second hand factory made boats out there at the right price to keep people away from having to consider potential nightmare buying. Thankfully, trailers and boats of the type likely to result in hull cracking are pretty much a thing of the past, but there is still the odd one or two in circulation on the second hand market, so it does pay to know what might happen. Poor construction either on its own or more likely in collusion with an outboard either too big or too powerful for the boat in question can result in stress cracks which while they might not let water into the boat can seriously undermine the integrity of the transom by allowing water to penetrate beneath the gel coat. Gel wear caused by the abrasive action of winching on a beach boat can also be a problem but providing it hasn't exposed any matting it is retrievable. If, however, the full thickness of the gel has been worn away, a protective layer will need to be glassed over it. If water between the floors is a problem, and it's not getting in via cracks in the hull, then either the floor itself or the floor well bung may be leaking. To check for this, raise the front of the boat up on the jockey wheel, then remove the floor well bung. If it hasn't got one, how can anyone check whether there is a problem or not, in which case, or if water comes out, I would walk away. Storing the boat with the jockey wheel fully extended is good policy at all times, 
as it helps prevent rainwater finding its way into the floor cavity through areas of damage along the floor edges or poor fitting of the floor in the first place by gravity feeding it into the floor well and out through the transom bung. Alternatively, you could fit a full cover to prevent rainwater getting access in the first place. For the reasons mentioned in the new outfit film, try to avoid rubber mounted windows or at least be satisfied they have been fitted properly and are not loose. Bolted or riveted windows fitted on a bed of silicon sealant are a much more reliable bet. Apart from that, providing you can live with the instruments where you might not want them or having holes left where they used to be, then all well and good. With regard to outboard engines, I think it goes without saying that reliability is the single most crucial factor when it comes to buying second hand, but there are other important considerations too. All boats are designed with an optimum and a maximum outboard motor rating. Too much weight can damage the transom or cause the boat to ride dangerously. Too little and a potentially fast hull is wasted along with the extra money needed to feed it with fuel as it will run uneconomically off the plane. One check you can make without any problem is to look at the propeller blades for signs of impact damage. This can throw the whole balance of the propeller out. Fortunately this is easily rectified by a good aluminium welder but that shouldn't be a job left for you. Another quick easy check you can make is to examine the skeg. Damage other than abrasion by sand is a potential indicator of abusive use. Blistered paintwork like this is both unsightly and unnecessary and is usually the result of electrolysis caused by different metals being immersed in seawater. This little gadget was designed to prevent all that. And here's another one. These are sacrificial anodes made from a metal that is weaker than the engine casing so that they will corrode away instead. A further job you can do for yourself is to check for play in the rubber mounts. These support the engine leg and soak up vibration where it comes into contact with the saddle. Newer outboards now do this job in a different way and are unlikely to give problems, in the short term at least. With the external inspection complete, remove the cowl. Unfortunately, much of what goes on inside the powerhead cannot be seen but there are still clues waiting to be picked up on. Like checking for play in the main bearings by waddling the flywheel from side to side. I'm trying the crankshaft main bearing on the top end of the engine and in this case this engine is absolutely perfect. There's no play whatsoever. And open up any electrical connections, particularly the main harness plugs to check for oxidation of the pins. This is the multi-pin connector that the wiring harness connects to the engine. It's always a good idea to check this because if there's any oxidation inside this can cause tracking of the electrical current which in turn could burn out some of the electrical components on the engine. As you can see here we've um, got a silicone type grease inside and uh, this uh, will protect uh, the terminals from any corrosion. At some stage in the process the engine will need to be fired up be very suspicious of poor starting. If the seller doesn't put a hose fed muff over the water intake as shown here without being prompted, then any warm up and previous maintenance running can only be assumed to have been done dry with the potential for damage to the impeller. Look for a good jet of cooling water being discharged. This should increase in force when the engine is revved. A poor water return could be due to impeller damage. Equally, it could be due to salt buildups impeding water flow around the cooling system through not flushing the engine thoroughly after every run out at sea. All of this said, at the end of the day, you can't beat having an outboard mechanic take a look at it on your behalf. Compression testing is also well worth the investment. And even with a good outboard, a full service and having the carb set up properly, as is being done here, will bring additional peace of mind. To have any sort of confidence at all in an engine, you really need to see how it performs under load, which means a run out on the water. Has it got the power it should have, and do the gears select properly, or do they jump out while underway? 
you should also ask to see any servicing receipts. Finally, a look at second-hand trailers. The importance of a decent trailer to the reliability and flexibility of most outfits cannot be overstated. It's only when you start clocking up miles on the road that the true value of trailer investment, or lack of it, tells its own story. With so many different hull shapes and sizes, it's hardly surprising that there is a whole raft of often ingenious innovations in trailer design out there to cope with them, particularly on the homemade trailer scene. As you would expect, there are also some bad ones out there too. I personally would not entertain any trailer that does not have a self-centering cradle. Even in the calmest of conditions, getting a boat onto a trailer without the self-centering cradle shown here doesn't always go according to plan. Without one, particularly in lumpy conditions over the high water period, life can become unnecessarily hard. Also, avoid wherever possible painted trailers. Apart from a constant battle to keep rust on the treated exterior at bay, you can do little or nothing to prevent corrosion of the box section interiors. Then one day, the main spine of the trailer suddenly gives way under the strain of winching on, leaving you with no means of getting off the beach. Check out the hubs for grease nipples. Fresh grease needs to be pumped in to displace water ingress before heading home after every trip. Submerged hub launches are an invitation for water to get inside. No grease nipples, no preventative maintenance. Unless of course the hubs are fitted with bearing saver grease reservoirs. On a trailer with brakes, which is most trailers these days, also worry about what might be inside the brake drum. As we all know, it's difficult to keep brakes dipped in seawater in good working order. But be sure at least that they don't look like this one. Check out the tow hitch too. Again, there are some poor ones out there. Satisfy yourself that it stays locked onto the tow ball. Over the years, I reckon I've tried most of them, and this is the one I currently use. Knackered flattened rollers that don't rotate won't help much either. Rollers which fail to provide support contact with the hull, or are either too far back or too far forward, are another area for concern. For pottering around close to base, and for fishing settled sheltered waters such as an estuary or large harbour, there's a lot of pleasure and self-satisfaction to be had from a modest second-hand outfit, so long as it's up to the job that you expect of it. Thinking back over the years, when dinghy fishing first began to take hold back in the early 70s, all outfits and equipment would fit into the category of basic by today's standards. Yet some of the fish we had in them would still be specimens in anybody's book. We had fishing that could never hope to be matched by the outfits we have today because the fish are simply no longer there. But it shows what a modest outfit can achieve given the chance. We once had an Irish white skate of 140 pounds inside a 15 foot sea hog hunter and several cod topping 30 pounds, the best of which tipped the scales at 38 pounds from within shouting distance of the Blackpool shoreline. Big Top, Rays and Conger also spent time on the deck of an even early displacement boat because the boats were up to it and despite the lack of size by today's standards so too were the engines because they were well maintained. All in all, a case of buyer beware, particularly if you don't want to end up like this, or heaven forbid, not getting back at all.